Hello everyone and welcome to the third webinar for Fishing Countermeasures, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University, or CSU. Thank you for joining us. My name is Guy and I'll MC this webinar and your mentor as usual is Bianca Worth. And again, Diane is here to moderate and respond to you in chat. Not much for me to, uh, this week, thankfully, um, but just a few words on Zoom's webinar functions as usual for those who are new to it. We encourage the asking of questions and the use of chat during the webinar, and there are two ways to do so that we use. We ask that you direct all course content related questions to the Q&A section, and you send all administration type questions to, this, to Diane in chat. And I'll be looking at chat too. Uh, you can chat with panelists only if it's something you just want to talk in private about, or to all of your fellow students as well. Um, and you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log. So yeah, make sure it's all panelists and attendees. As I always say, there are some very experienced and, and interesting industry-based attendees who will generally be most helpful with any queries anyone has. Uh, we'll have Q&A sessions periodically, so chuck your questions in Q&A, or, in, uh, or I might interrupt if the question is particularly relevant to anything Bianca has to say. Can you please welcome Bianca for her third webinar? Thanks, Guy. Thanks, everybody. Hi, how's it all going? There we go. There, the lights go off right on cue. <laughs> um, so welcome to week three. This week is quite an interesting uh, and exciting week because we're going to walk through fishing simulations. So uh, simulations are designed to educate your employees and essentially you fish your own um, own employees, staff, partners, whoever it is that you choose to target. Um, and the idea behind it is when they click on one of the phishing links that you send to them for e through email, for example, um, they're presented instead of with something malicious with a education page or information, videos, animations, games, whatever you want to present with, um, to them and are capable of presenting to them through the platform that you use. So we will we'll touch on the different types of platforms uh, today as well. But before we do that, let's go through and have a look at the overall agenda. So we've got um, an introduction to phishing simulations. Then we'll go a little bit into the interesting psychology of changing user behavior. And that'll help inform the how you design the phishing simulations and how you uh, get employees to click. Um, with the idea that you want them to to reduce the number of clicks, but if they do click, you want to educate them on on you know how to identify the um, uh, phishing emails or other communications in the in the future. Then we'll go through a model of, of a common phishing attack, so the end user view and the technical view, and we then we go through the phishing simulation process itself and designing an effective phishing simulation, and then an introduction introduction to some phishing simulation tools, some free ones and some paid ones. There's lots of good ones out there um, and some are free and some are paid. Some are open source and some are commercial. Okay, so back to our phishing ecosystem poster that we've been going through each week. And this week, the topic falls within these areas. So we've got phishing simulation. So right across the spectrum of uh, preparing, protect, detect, respond. Uh, we've got this education piece that happens along the people side of things. So let's go through that now. Okay, introduction to phishing simulations. So the one thing that I want to outline is that the purpose of simulations is not to prove to your employees that you know more about phishing. It's not to make them look stupid um, and it's not to surprise them. Um, Although phishing simulations are can be a good way to identify, for example, if you run a pilot with your employees first and, um, you know, run a simulation, get the statistics from it and report that back to, to executive management, that can be a good way of getting support for education programs in your environment. Um, but you don't do it at the expense of, you know, making your employees look silly. Um, you've got to do it in a very careful and considered way. So we'll go through a few of those tips over the next two weeks as um, next week we cover sort of developing the strategy around simulations. So what are the goals of phishing simulations? Essentially, they're designed to teach the recipient, your employees, partners, whoever that might be, to identify phishing communications and report phishing attempts. 
you want them to identify them, obviously, because you don't want them to click, but you also want them to report them because coming back to what we did last week around uh, analyzing emails and uh, blocking uh, bad senders and all that sort of thing, you want to be able to I employees to be able to report them so that you can identify those parameters, block them at the various email servers or um, anti-spam filters or whatever you, measures you've got in place uh, so that they don't get through to more employees um, than is necessary. So you kind of want to minimize that. So the more reporting that employees do, the better it is for uh, protecting your environment and making sure they don't wheedle their way too far into your environment uh, at all. So a quick model of a common email phishing attack. So this is from the user perspective. Essentially, we've got on this side, ground zero. So just summarizing everything we've sort of learned to date. We've got hackers or bad people, malicious actors. They send you an email. It might look pretty real or be very identifiable and you open it. Then the goal is to trick you into clicking a link or opening an attachment, providing your personal details or whatever the method might be. Then, for example, your data may go, may go out to the dark web, or can also go to the public web to be sold or used by the malicious actor as well. Uh, and there's online marketplaces, as we found out with week one, that operate solely for selling your details. Um, or they can, for example, if they store malware on your computer, um, they can use a computer as part of a botnet, for example, to do bad stuff. Um, whether that's a DDoS attacks or um, th when they actually have your data, they can buy stuff, transfer money, uh, hold your account to ransom, build profiles of you for social engineering purposes to further get more information out of you, see your identity and use it uh, for fairly non-malicious uh, activities such as fake social media followings. Um, but from a designing a phishing email perspective, um, you have to go through sort of four main steps. So the first is you've got the lure and that's your plausible reason. Uh, you have imagery in there that supports the plausible reason that you're sending this email. For example, I want to send an invoice. Um, so I'll include a logo um, of whoever the company is that's uh, sending the invoice, say PayPal, for example. Um, you may spoof the email, which is what we learned about last week. And you may obfuscate the URL, so make them hidden. Um, a common method recently is, to, for example, to use uh, URL shorteners in the email. Uh, for link, any hyperlinks, and that makes it easy for them to hide what the true destination is. Uh, but using those tools that we went through in week two um, will help you identify and flesh those out. There's actually a tool, and I believe we put it in the resources as well, that can, um, on the phishingcountermeasures.com site, that will take a shortened URL and expand it so that you can see what the uh, true destination is. So that's a um, handy tool to have as well. So then you set the hook. Essentially, you might set up a website where you want to capture the details. Uh, you may hack a website if you're a bad person. Uh, but from our perspective, we're going to um, set up education pages. Uh, you might use root kicks or phishing kits. Um, you might have corporate templates that you use. You can actually take emails from um, the ones that you receive, view the source on them and copy their details to get a, sort of a basic template that you can work from. But I would set um, a really strong caution here in that you shouldn't be using other people's logos. So for example, PayPal's logos or the tax office or whoever it might be, um, you definitely shouldn't be using other people's logos. You run into copyright issues. So you, with your phishing education campaigns, you kind of need to come up with a way to make it look similar, but not similar enough to get you into legal trouble. Um, so you can got to think about that each time that you design a phishing simulation and who it's from. We'll go through that in a bit more detail. Then you want to make it look really convincing. So have similar URLs or at least plausible URLs. So say, for example, you send out a, an invoice email to your employees and you want to get them to open it and you're kind of making it a hard um, simulation and I'll go walk, walk through easy, medium and hard later on. Uh, but say you want to make it a little bit hard, you kind of want to go for a URL that's like, um, that's very similar to the topic. So for invoices, you might make it um, financedepartment.com or whatever the the, um, the email might be. So it might be um, accounts payable at financedepartment.com. Um, and then you can mimic things like HTTPS as well. The bad guys definitely do that to make it look like um, that the, the site that you're visiting is safe. 
um, because people have been taught to um, believe the padlock in the top um, and the padlock, all the padlock does, obviously, if you're a technical person, you would know this, um, but for those that don't, the padlock uh, encrypts the data between uh, the website and the person visiting it, but it does nothing to prove that the website is actually a safe one. Um, so they do use that as a technique now that they know that people have been educated on that. And then the catch. So what is the data that you actually want to catch? You've got confidential data, usernames and passwords. You might want to get admin access to something um, or corporate access to uh, servers or systems that people use. Okay, so let's touch a little bit on the psychology behind phishing. So why change user behavior? So why is it that we want to educate people on phishing attempts? Okay, so before we go any further, I wanted to put this slide up because obviously I'm teaching you how to uh, fish people, but I want you to please use what you learn for good and not for evil. So from a psychology perspective, there's a number of decision making, um, there's a number of decision making uh, areas that will affect your fishing success. So from the, we've got sort of three, areas so we've got psychological triggers uh, individual differences and visual and structural cues only some of these you can actually influence when you design and send out a phishing simulation um, so obviously for example you can't influence uh, someone's state of mind at that at the time that they receive your email um, often you'll send phishing simulations across the course of say a week or two weeks or a month you're just not going to be able to send it um, within that sort of detailed um, context um, they might be angry at the time. You just can't influence those factors. So, for example, down here in uh, individual differences, their current psychological state, so what their current emotion is, emotions are, um, you know, those are things you're not going to be able to influence. Training, you might not have any idea um, or a minimal idea about what sort of training that they have currently, especially when you first start out with phishing simulations in your organisation. Um People have individual behavioural traits. That's just how people are. Um, they ha would have differences in demographics. So, for example, they're a different age. Um, they, to each other, they, you, you know, you'll have everyone from sort of your 20s right through to, you know, 60s sort of age ranges in a typical organisation. Um, and some of them may um, respond differently. There have been studies that have been done, but then every time one study comes out and says, oh, there's definitely demographic differences between, you know, older people or younger people, uh, you know, older people are more susceptible or, um, you know, university students uh, click more or whatever it might be. There's another study that comes out and completely reverses that. So, um, you can't depend too much on demographic um, characteristics from studies, but it will be interesting as you go and uh, conduct phishing simulations in your environment and you have demographics that you can add to the data that you report on to see if there are sort of any generic um, similarities between your population uh, because that may change um, from a broad perspective from industry to industry. So um, people's personality you know people uh, like the behavioral traits um, everyone is their own person um, habits so everyone develops their own habits as well from the way that they sort of for example read their emails they might click through um, really quickly they might um, quickly open things check if they're um, applicable and then close them down again that's just the way that that person uh, works for example so you're actually trying to change people's habits with phishing um, and I have to say that probably Having worked in technical and process, uh, people are, are often the hardest thing to change um, because people develop habits, they have their own personalities and they all think differently. Um, technology, you can kind of program it and it generally behave um, in, a, in a known manner. So the other, so the sort of the individual differences side of things, and there's not too much that you're going to be able to influence here when you actually design your phishing simulations, apart from perhaps the, the training side of things. Um, from the psychological perspective, so there's a few different biases that people just have ingrained um, in them that can affect the um, their response to phishing simulations as well. So, for example, we've got um, uh, the c context. Um, so that's the, that's called a framing effect, where essentially they um, their reaction depends on how the situation pr is presented to them. Uh, so it's the context of um, how it's presented uh, as to how they'll respond. There's the availability heuristic, and that's essentially a shortcut, sh shortcut that everybody makes 
or it's a number of shortcuts that we make in our daily lives and we make quick decisions uh, based on what we already know or what we're able to um, easily recall. Uh, and then another one is confirmation bias, for example, where you have a tendency to interpret information um, that is consistent with your own beliefs. So if you believe in something strongly, then you're more likely to, um, you know, if something confirms that belief, then you're more likely to um, believe in, in what has been presented. Um, and then obviously other psychological triggers as well are relationships. So for example, people have been tricked by uh, scam emails, phishing emails or phishing communications that um, come from, you know, people's that they know their email accounts have been hacked or their, you know, phones or whatever it might be or social media. You receive a, a message on social media saying, I've lost my wallet and I'm stuck in London. Um, you know, please send me some money so that I can get home. Um, or get my passport back or whatever it might be. So they're depending on those relationships um, to trigger something within you to make you click essentially without thinking or open something without thinking. Then you've got uh, the, on this other side over here, you've got visual and structural clues. So this is the area that you're most going to be able to influence with um, designing and sending out phishing simulations within your organization. So for example, you could design trust indicators. Like I said, there's a misconception that SSL um, by, you know, just the average um, uh, person out there that SSL makes a, a site secure. So you could, for example, uh, have SSL on the website that you've set up. Um, you could have uh, phishing warnings that say, you know, this is a safe site, it's been assessed, for example, or endorsements. There was actually a study done that found that um, elements like endorsements say if it's got a, um, you know, this has been deemed a safe site, a safe website, a little stamp on it, um, and it sort of mocks, mocks up a um, example of that from well-known uh, vendors, then they're more trustworthy. Uh, you've got social ind engagement indicators. So a study found that, for example, if you have click to chat um, as a social, social engagement indicator on a website, people are more likely to trust it. Um, so if you had those structural clues and visual and structural clues on the either the email or the communication that you're sending out and on the site that they visit once they click, for example, or inside of the attachment, um, they're going to be more likely to uh, um, respond. And also you need to think about these things in the context of how hard or easy uh, you want the emails to be. So we'll go through that in a little bit more detail soon. Um, the email design is another uh, visual and structural clues that you can give to people. So logos, the supporting imagery that you have inside of the emails, for example, and the actual layout. Um, one example is that we designed a phishing simulation that looked very much like the Android um, Google Play Store uh, uh, invoice. So when you clicked in Android to uh, buy something off Google Play, um, you get a very standard sort of structure and layout there. And we sort of uh, uh, mocked that up in our emails and sent it out, although we were very careful, as I mentioned before, to remove any Google Play logos or trademarks or any of that sort of thing. Um, to make sure that we weren't infringing on any of the, the rights of the, um, uh, the uh, vendor there. So the other thing that you can obviously provide um, clues on is the URL. So you can make it easier or harder for people, uh, depending on what they would be expecting, um, coming back to the context side of things. Um, you've got email visual uh, metadata as well. So who it's from can influence people. So it looks like it's from a valid person versus it looks like it's from someone from Yahoo. Um, or Google or um, Hotmail, for example, and social engagement indicators we've kind of covered already. So there's an interesting book called uh, Fishing Dark Waters, and uh, it's by some well-known social engineers. And essentially, they've sort of said that um, the quality of a decision isn't always related to our satisfaction with it. With it. Uh, decision making is a sum of a number of factors. So all those factors that I described on the uh, previous page, uh, they all become the sum of um, how hard or easy it is for employees to determine if an email or a communication is a phishing uh, communication. So we make large and small decisions every day without having all the relevant information we might need. And the key part here is we make some large and small decisions fairly frequently without any thought of all. And uh, based on the discussions that I've had with people who have been uh, duped into phishing, um, you know, you kind of, uh, you, some things are ingrained within, within you 
and those decisions you make quickly um, and you kind of just don't think about them. Uh, that's the way that you work. So uh, that's, you know, when people say that, um, you know, I don't, I haven't been fished or, um, you know, I wouldn't get fished because I know all about this topic. There was a really interesting uh, study that was done. Uh, I'll, I believe I've put it in the notes in the readings for this week, where sometimes if you educate people, um, they actually uh, are more likely to be uh, duped or scammed um, because they've just got too much information. So it's really uh, important to provide the right amount of information. And we'll get to that around I think in this these slides or maybe uh, next week as well in terms of what type of information is the right type of information and how much of it. But essentially keeping it really simple is important and not having conflicting messages. So the overall phishing simulation process. So if you were to go through and set, in, set up a phishing simulation uh, for your organization, uh, this would be a sort of standard process that you would go through. So essentially, first you uh, would obtain your employee data and identify your targets. Um, this is, for example, you go out, get your employee list and identify who is it that we're going to include in our phishing education campaign, phishing simulation education campaign. Then you go ahead and design the scenario. So the scenario is um, the email or the communication that you're going to send out. Um, you know, all those factors that I, I mentioned around what, who it's from, um, you know, what the subject line's going to be, um, what the content's going to be, what sort of imagery you're going to have. Then you create the education content. So what's going to happen or what information is going to appear once they've actually clicked or opened uh, an attachment or, um, like I said, clicked a link or opened an attachment. Um, so you want to be able to provide clear, succinct educational information to say, hey, this was a phishing simulation, don't worry, but here's how you can um, detect that this was a uh, these emails like these were phishing simula uh, phishing emails in the in the future. Then you probably, depending on your environment, need to you know, especially in larger organisations whitelist links, domains, and senders, for example, um, so that they don't get caught in your anti spam and anti phishing um, technology. Then you would test your scenario, make sure it appears how you want it to appear, it's formatted correctly. Um, so you'd have a group of people yourself and you know one or two other people at least that would go through and check that um, to make sure and give you feedback on streamlining it, and refining it, you know, playing with HTML and things like that. Things can be a little bit out of whack, for example. Then I recommend that you send out stakeholder notifications. So at the start of your campaign, you'd identify who your key stakeholders are, who is it that needs to know? And we'll touch on that a little bit further. Um, then you schedule your scenario. So when are you going to send it for the dates it executes? Then you analyze the results that come back, uh, create a report. And I've mentioned updating a leaderboard, uh, communicating monthly winners and sending rewards. So we'll cover that a little bit further on in terms of what we do uh, to help our employees engage in this education campaign. Okay, so the first section is, uh, first step is obtain employee data and identify your targets. So you've got to identify, are you targeting everyone or is it just a subset of people? For example, when you go through developing an education uh, strategy for your employees, you'd more than likely go through and identify the key risks uh, to your organization that are human-based risks. Um, so one of those risks might be our finance department uh, continuously get uh, phishing emails, fake invoices, they're are at high risk um, and it's a high likelihood that it's going to happen. Um, so they're a key target. Maybe you'd start with just rolling out to uh, phishing education simulations to them to start with. Or you can do a big bang approach and actually roll it out to all your employees. Then what employee data do you want to correlate with these results? So as I mentioned previously, you could have additional demographics um, around, you know, if you can gather that from HR around, uh, you know, age, um, you know, locations where they work, um, you know, anything else that you think might be useful to be able to report on and to group and gather people. So departments, for example, uh, maybe you find that you've got uh, specific departments that don't do um, particularly well on phishing simulations. So you need to provide them with a bit more hands-on education support. Then you step into designing the scenario itself. Um, so with designing the scenario, you, as I mentioned before, it's your from, um, you know, what's the subject line going to be and what's the content going to be. So 
when you go in and create your scenarios, so in this week's lab, we're actually going through and creating a end-to-end -end, uh, simulation. So all this information here will help inform that. But when you go in and you've got, uh, for example, once you've done this a few times and you've got, you know, a hundred simulations that you've run ac across the course of, you know, a year or two years, for example, uh, it's really useful to have a standard naming convention like you do when you're building servers and things like that. You, you have a standard naming convention for things um, where you can identify when the simulation, who the simulation was sent to, for example, your country code, which I've got here, uh, what year it was sent in, what month. Um, we use a, a baseline number or you can use a baseline number. So, for example, um, you might design a phishing simulation to send out once and if people fail it, they just fail it. Whereas you might actually have um, that same simulation uh, as a standard. If people fail it, um, you actually send that same simulation out again until they pass it. So uh, you might say uh, B1 is the first simulation, B2 is the, the second simulation for only the people that failed the first time, B3 is for the people that fa failed the second time again. Uh, if they failed it probably three times, it's it's probably time to have a, a um, more hands-on or one-to-one -one chat or discussion with them about uh, phishing simulation or phishing um, emails or communications. Um, but there can be other reasons that people click or open that can skew your results and make it look like they're failing simulations. Um, an example of that might be um, that uh, we have had the factor of I was interested to see what the education was this month <laughs> and um, you know you'll get some random stuff so actually uh, surveying your population and for the people that fail multiple times you can find that it may not just be an education problem it may be other factors that come into play as to why they're actually opening it opening it up uh, then we've got a three-letter classification so I'll talk about the classifications, easy, medium, hard. So you might have, uh, as we've got here, um, oh, sorry, the classification is, for example, link, L-I-N uh, means it's a link-based uh, email. Uh, if it was attachment, it'd be A-T-T -T here. Um, and then data entry, B-D-A-T, for example. And then uh, E-A-S means easy. And if I was to have a hard simulation, it'd be H-A-R and MED for medium. So that's just a recommendation. I mean, you can come up with any uh, standard naming scenario, uh, uh, scenario um, that you want, um, but that's just something that helps us track um, our scenarios. So as I mentioned before, hello, we have light. Uh, we've got the uh, metadata that we want to plan. So uh, what name, what the sender email address is, and then what you select here will actually depend on the tool as well that you use, the tools we're going to cover a bit later on. But for example, some tools just give you a set of say 20 or 30 pre-registered domains that they have enabled for your use. And uh, that's all you've got to work with. Other tools like open source tools, for example, you can potentially enter in or forge any data into the domain field. So you could come up with whatever you like. Just be careful with using domains that you're not use, actually using someone, someone's real domain. Uh, make up and check that you're using a fake, completely fake unregistered domain. Uh, if you are sort of uh, spoofing that domain inside of things, because we, you know, you can have instances of people contacting those, um, the owners of those domains uh, and, you know, um, they could say stuff to them um, if they're quite annoyed with the simulation that went out thinking that it was a real um, phishing email if they don't actually open up the education or read through the education correctly. Um, so just take that into consideration is that you don't want to get other people into trouble or, you know, um, send uh, your angry uh, employees off to other people to um, hurl abuse at them, for example. Uh, and you will get some random people who get uh, very, um, have very negative attitude towards phishing simulations. And some people, uh, depending on how you pitch it in your organization and how, you know, you reward people or um, recognize people for doing a good job, um, you know, you, you can have some fairly negative to really positive um, attitudes towards these types of things. So you do have to take this a little bit carefully. Like I said before, we're working with people um, and people can be um, a little bit harder to, to deal with and predict than, you know, um, a server, for example. Uh, so 
Also consider the difficulty level. So when you're selecting the name and email address of the domain, will it closely align with the email theme um, so that it's harder to detect as a fish or will it be not connected at all? Uh, for example, if you, I had an email that was titled, um, you know, say it was a, our example of an invoice uh, email and it was just called from, you know, it was barry at uh, christmascards.com. Okay, that's probably an easier one for people to determine, you know, once they look at the, the from um, email address that it's probably not a phishing email and that makes it a little bit easier for them to detect. Again, what data are you going to collect? So if in a data entry scenario, so data entry scenarios are, um, well, the three different types of scenarios we, ha we have are links so you can embed a link um, that people click on and it takes them to a web page that's got education on it we've got data entry where you take them to a web page they enter credentials that you prompt them for and then they're shown well, after they hit enter they then they're shown an education page um, and we've got attachment so they open up an attachment say a word document or a pdf document and inside of the attachment is the ed education information so um, they're sort of your three main um, data collection scenarios that you can use and data entry you've got to think okay what data am i actually going to collect am i asking them for their username their password whatever it is um, and, a, and a lot of um, the commercial products won't collect the data that's entered they'll tell you if data has been entered but they won't tell you what has been entered so you can be assured that pe if people are actually trying to put in their passwords they haven't collected that information so that's something to check with a vendor um, before you go ahead and implement a solution like this and then uh, as i mentioned we use trust indicators for example when they visit a web page uh, you're going to have ssl or um, you know click to chat or whatever it is that you think um, would help them trust the the website more Um, okay, so we covered this a little bit in the psychology section, uh, but in essence, in simulations, the conditions that you can influence um, or use to your advantage are the context. So how relevant is this to the recipient? Um, we'll go through a few of those bits and pieces. Probability, the likelihood of receiving a similar communication. Um, you would not be surprised, I guess, about how many times people are waiting at home for a parcel and they receive a phishing email that says, your parcel has been delayed or click here to see the status of your parcel. Um, so there's a high, that's why the uh, malicious actors send out those types of emails because there's a high probability, like banking ones, there's a high probability that someone is waiting for a parcel at home at that point in time. There's a high probability that someone has a bank account with that uh, nominated bank. Um, emotions. So how will you dr drive the recipient to action? And you've got to be a little bit careful in a corporate or commercial scenario where um, you're playing on people's emotions to make them um, action something in the email. Um, a good example is um, sending a, an email out to employees and say, for example, it says um, you you have a debt collection notice and you've generated all these feelings within them around having a debt, which can be really quite personal for people. Um, and people can get really upset about um, having a debt. Obviously, it's a stressful uh, situation to be in for um, anyone who's in that situation. And for them to then be lumped with another debt on top of that or to think that they've been lumped with another debt on top of that, they can, uh, it can you know, explode essentially. Um, so you gotta be really careful about the way that you word the emails as well. Um, I'd suggest that although you want to design communications so that they understand that the malicious actors are gonna send them in this way um, and they're not gonna care about your emotions or your feelings, that's exactly what they wanna play on. You are in a corporate situation and if you're doing this for an education purposes, you kind of have to have a bit of an invisible boundary there in terms of how far is too far in pushing people. So um, one example might be in the scenario where I said you're talking about a debt and sending out a debt notice to someone, I'd suggest that you relate it back to the company. So that, um, you know, so say it was me, IAG has a debt as opposed to you personally have a debt. Um, and that way you'll still generate an emotion within them, but it won't be of, um, uh, what I would call a highly intense emotion um, that may make them very upset at a personal level um, and may not go do any, you know, use um, or 
generate any positivity in your actual fishing simulations. So um, similarity, so the design and the style as well to make them reflective of what a recipient would, have, uh, would expect. So you can either make them really similar or really not um, really easy to detect as something that's fake. So along the context side of things, so the relevance, uh, you can play on things like timing, uh, seasonal, current events, uh, likelihood betting, as I mentioned, the postage delivery one, or someone's going to have a bank account of this type. Um, social expectations. So this is one they use for uh, spearfishing and whaling, for example. Uh, they use, um, the, they have the use of authority. And, uh, you know, um, if it's someone, they pretend to be someone higher up than the person that's been, the email or message is being sent to, um, you know, some people will just go ahead and obey that, um, that authority. Uh, so that could play on the role, their status, um, you can use the content. Uh, you can also, for example, use, uh, I think way back in um, week one, we uh, discussed, for example, using reference numbers and legal statements and, uh, you know, you'll be penalised and all this sort of thing. So they're all things that you can use as well. And then you've got the context of business versus personal. So as I mentioned, um, on the personal side of things, especially around finances, um, potentially try to limit that. Um, but other things uh, that are a bit more personal, such as picking up a package, uh, take in a generally a little bit better by people um, than financial matters. So um, also uh, other good business ones, I think I've got some examples on the next page. For example, um, you know, you've received a fax or you've received a scanned uh, message, uh, you know, printed document, whatever it might be. Then you can play on probability. So there's levels of probability that you can play with here in terms of I was, um, or that you can kind of bet on that someone at some point was either expecting it um, I was expecting something similar. I wasn't expecting it, but it's rather viable um, or I wasn't expecting anything. Um, and that comes back to things like your timing and, um, you know, seasonal stuff, current events, etc. Then you play on people's emotions. And like I said, uh, be careful with playing on people's emotions. Um, you've got emotions such as uh, greed. So, um, uh, not trying to say that uh, people are greedy when they want to go for cash, but hey, you know, free cash we'd all love a bit of free cash um fear so uh you know potentially uh identifying that people would be um penalized for not doing something um legal time constraints um using compassion so this is one that um you don't see lots of in the fishing world, um, but it can be used. So I, I think I mentioned in one of the previous weeks that, for example, people have used um, the compassion line uh, when, for example, uh, bad events happen globally in the world. So say a tornado or um, you know floods or whatever it might be, they jump on and pretend to be um, some of the organisations that are trying to help people aid organisations, for example. Again, be a little bit careful about what you do there um, because uh, people can get really upset if you play on their compassion and then it turns out not to be um, true. It turns out to be a simulation. Uh, reward and recognition. So, for example, if you have corporate awards, um, you could that could fall into this category. Uh, social influence, including uh, friendship, helpfulness and politeness. Again, be really careful with this one because it can backfire quite badly. Um, entertainment. So entertainment tends to work okay for uh, fishing simulations um, because people are not too emotionally involved in it and they're not go generally going to be too upset um, that if it turns out to be um, not true or a simulation. Uh, curiosity also can work well and excitement um, about something happening. Again, and with all those sort of positive emotions, uh, excitement and social influence and compassion, um, just be a little bit careful about those, about using them in a corporate scenario. So the fourth area is similarity. So you can look at uh, the existing phishing emails that you're receiving into your environment and um, not copy, but um, make them quite similar. Um, you can use uh, similar image imagery, just watch out for those copyrights side of things as well on the logo. Um, you can use similar domains, sender names, brand colors, um, and footer notifications, for example, but change them up to suit your purpose. So some common corporate-related uh, themes or personal themes that work. Um, so financial and payment services, ten uh, services tend to work. So the advanced fees side of things um, still works. 
invoice payments still work. So I'll just uh, flick over here for the advanced fee side of things. Um, this was the top 10 scams by amount lost uh, last year and from the investment side of things. So those advanced fee uh, scams still work. So $5.2 million was lost in Australia on those scams. So those things still work, even though you'd think they, they wouldn't. On the personal side of things, social media can work quite well. There's less of a personal investment for people uh, motion wise in uh, receiving like, um, you know, Bob wants to connect with you on LinkedIn or you wouldn't use the brand name LinkedIn, but you'd make up your own similar um, social media name, misspellings, whatever it might be. Um, retail and shopping, uh, so gifts and rewards or things like that you can use from a retail perspective, delivery of packages, as I mentioned. Um, also, you know, if you are going to use delivery of packages, don't use the brand names like Australia Post or Star Track or DHL or FedEx or whatever it might be, unless you have permission from them. Um, I have heard of people asking for permission to send phishing simulation emails out in their organization from uh, corporates such as uh, those, and they have been granted, and then other, other times they have been denied. So it's up to you whether you go down that path. Uh, and then order confirmations and purchases. So um, that's a quite a good one that works as well. Offers communications, as mentioned before, file from a scanner, person, cloud service, fax, for example. Um, so uh, cloud service might be, you know, your own version of Dropbox, for example, but not Dropbox. Uh, internal social media notifications. So if you use social media internally, uh, just with communications and all of these things as well, just remember to, um, if you're emulating communications that come from particular teams in your organization, that they're aware that you're emulating something uh, that they're, that employees usually receive, um, just because you want to let them know um, they're probably going to get pinged about stuff. If you emulate something quite closely to what's usually sent out in your corporate environment, um, Say you use Yammer, for example, and you copy a standard Yammer email um, and you send that as a, a phishing simulation content, then uh, the people who manage Yammer in your organization or your internal comms team or technology teams or whoever it is are probably going to get um, uh, feedback on that uh, even because they're the, the people that people know to contact about this sort of thing. So you kind of do need to give a heads up to people that if you're doing things, communicating Applications that are similar to those that are already sent out within your, within your organization. And then finally, uh, ones that work really well are technology-based uh, communications. So authentication, for example, log in and reset your password, your account's been accessed, here's a notification, um, you know, your such and such is about to expire, uh, whatever it might be. So those work really well as well. Uh, I might stop there for just one minute. Guy, do we want to take any questions at this point? Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, I'll, I'll leave YMs to the end. Uh, I think you're going to be talking about labs anyway. Um, mm -hmm. There's a few questions for now. Aaron's asked in with regard to educated employees mm -hmm. uh, in, in parentheses. Uh, do, you, do you find uh, they are less likely to self-report that they have been fished because they don't want to feel stupid having, having been given the, all of the advantages of education? Um, I think the way that you construct your messaging internally is really important right from the get-go. Um, so, for example, providing people with a way to report phishing emails easily. Um, so, say, for example, having that little, a little report phishing um, button inside of your email box um, is really important to have that before you start phishing simulations, obviously, because people then have got no way to report them and it's kind of turns into a bit of a nightmare in terms of trying to train them to do that later. Um, but it, in terms of um, people reporting them, uh, things like the rewards side of things, which I'm going to go through, touch on a little bit tonight, but um, mainly next week, can also help towards that. So even if they do get um, duped uh, into opening a phishing email, we say to them, you know, uh, report it anyway because you're going to stop someone else from being, being duped, like you're doing something for the greater good. Um, so that's how we position it um, and is, is kind of a good way to go. Um, and also, uh, you're going to stop someone else uh, from clicking on the link and you could save someone. So, you, again, you're kind of appealing to their, um, you know, they may have been um, caught out 
but they could save someone else uh, by reporting it as well. So it really comes down to the way that you position your communications and how people get rewarded and, you know, um, how they understand what happens. Like they're not going to get penalized if they have opened a, a phishing email and they get caught out. Um, it's just that uh, we know for next time and we can show you how to do it better or how to identify something um, easier. So it's really um, sort of couching it in, in better terms uh, so they don't feel like they're going to get penalised and they need to hide it. And he sent in a follow-up question. What about in a live situation? Does it change anything? In a live situation? You might have to clarify that uh, as opposed to a phishing simulation, I guess, is what he's saying. I suppose so. Uh, so in a live situation, same communication model works. So whether it's live or it's a phishing simulation. So phishing simulations, are, for example, um, are treated no different to, to live ones. It's phishing, it's phishing. Um, it's just that, for example, uh, if you use a report phishing um, button and depending on which tool that you actually use, you can customize the messages for people that pop up after they report it. So, for example, uh, one of the tools that I go through, it actually provides you the ability to say, that was a phishing simulation, awesome job, you know, whatever message you want to give people there, you know, you've been entered into a draw or whatever for the end of the month um, because you identified that successfully as a phishing email. You can have a similar um Email, a message pop up for real phishing uh, emails as well, but you'd kind of change it a little bit, tweak it and say, hey, thanks for reporting that. Um, we'll investigate this and get right back to you to let you know whether it was a, a real phishing email or whether you can um, open it safely. So, um, yeah, I position it that way. Okay. Uh, Gillian has asked what would be the main reason for going through a, a simulated phishing process rather than a, a training session outlining how to recognize and report them. Mm -hmm. um, because usually uh, training situations, um, it's hard for people to, um, unless they've experienced something, often, um, you know, there's a few different ways that people learn about things. One of them is hands-on, um, one of them is verbally, and uh, one of them is visually. So they're sort of the three core modes of people learning. Um, this way provides you as well, like I'm not saying don't do all the other stuff around, you know, presenting to them, uh, do that as well. That complements what you're doing here with phishing simulations. Uh, but this provides a sort of an immersive experience for people to really truly identify on a re very regular basis. So you've got to do these phishing simulations regularly. You can't just do it once a year and expect that people are going to learn not to click on phishing emails, for example. Uh, that doesn't work. Um, so yeah, it, this provides a more immersive experience for them. Uh, it also provides ongoing engagement and reinforcement as well. Um, so whereas, you know, a, a sort of straightforward, I'm um, presenting something to you, it's generally not scalable uh, if you've got large populations of people that you need to educate. Um, and it's uh, less hands-on um, and you have to keep you know, you've got to come up with different ways to deliver the same message to people. Uh, whereas with phishing simulations, you can kind of customize that um, every month. They, can, they get something different uh, and they get to identify all the different common methods that um, phishing, uh, phishing emails or SMSs or whatever communication it is actually happen. Cameron's been running phishing campaigns in his workplace mm -hmm. uh, and he's considering whether to include proficiency with them in, in KPI metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, any, any thoughts on that? Um, so, for example, I presume the KPI metrics would link back to performance reviews, uh, potentially. Yeah, KPIs, uh, uh, introducing KPIs into everyone's employment contract yeah. uh, based on their simulator results and regular questionnaires, for example. Aiming to, aiming to a raise, to raise awareness and engagement. I think if you were going to do that, it'd be a good idea to um, test it as a, with a pilot group to start with, um, to see what the response is, uh, what's achievable, what's not. And obviously you can take all the data that you've learned about it from the phishing simulations that you've done over this period of time and see how reasonable it is uh, to, for people to be actually... Um, it, depends, it also depends on how you're going to structure it. So are you going to penalise? people uh, for not meeting their KPIs and what sort of impact does that have on them. Um, I know that um, I was speaking with a vendor the other day and they have a, ex they mentioned that one of their uh, customers has an extremely complex and it works really well for their environment. But when they told us about it, I thought, oh, that's not going to work for us. So it really depends on your environment as well. But they sort of have, he was saying that they have eight levels 
of, um, you know, that people go through. So, for example, you fail it once and you uh, have to do the same simulation again. And right down to, you know, actually then, you know, on the eighth level, they get penalized from a KPI perspective. So, um, yeah, think about how you're actually going to structure it, what's reasonable based on the data that you've already collected. Um, and, uh, yeah, how, um, I mean, this is something you've got to work through with HR um, and a number of other departments as well. So is everybody going to be up for this? Um, is everybody agreeable that this is a reasonable metric to put into people's KPIs? Um, personally, I don't see any um, problem with it. And it probably is a good way to get people to t uh, sit up and take notice. But uh, I guess you do run the risk of um, some potential negativity around it as well if people start getting penalised from a financial perspective on their bonuses um, if they don't meet the, meet the KPI if, or if it's an unreasonable target, I guess. I'd probably be on the front line of that being a, a slow adopter. Uh, <laughs> James has asked, what about, about the costs for simulations? Are they high? Uh, so it depends. So like I said, I'll, I'll go through that in a second in terms of there's some free ones that you can use. And there's actually some commercial ones that you can use for free, which is pretty cool. And um, obviously then it comes down to resourcing internally. So you've got to have someone that can, you know, set this all up. Um, and I'll, I'll talk through this a little bit more next week in terms of um, people and resourcing and things like that, um, keeping things fresh. So obviously as, if you're developing education content regularly, you're going to have someone to develop that and put time towards it. So if you use one of the free tools, you've still got resourcing um, and content development costs that'll go uh, around that. And that will come down to how frequently you run your simulations as well. Okay, maybe we'll keep going with 7.54 and we'll get to the okay. rest of the questions later on. Alrighty. So let's keep going. So I, I touched on that one. So here's our difficult levels. Um, I went through quite a lot of research and no, not a lot of research. Well, there were bits and pieces, but none of them really told me uh, I wanted some difficulty levels that I could say, okay, this month we're sending an easy email and, you know, we're going to start with easy and then we're going to work our way up to hard or really hard. Um, so I just came up with some, um, basic guidelines and you guys can use this or um, come up with your own. So easy, for example, we provide them with three visual, three plus visual uh, clues and those clues might be misspelled words or poor grammar, um, low resolution graphics. So they might be stretched graphics or logos, for example, or fuzzy. Um, there's a limited work context for them. So it might be a uh, personal context or it's to do with something completely random. Um, uh, so not some of the popular stuff. So not like banking things, not, um, you know, app store port purchases, et cetera. Um, it might be something, you know, to do with cricket and, you know, you've signed up for cricket, whatever, and you could be probably guaranteed that half your population um, doesn't do anything with cricket. So it'd be pretty easy for them to detect that. Uh, it uh, the links is unrelated to the state, stated purpose. Uh, you've got multiple recipients with the content. So you'll often see lots of people in the two line. That's a dead giveaway. Uh, and there's common links for different purposes. Uh, so for example, they'll say, click here to do this. And then they'll have a report something here. And it's the same, same link that they're using. Then the medium side of things, I made that one to two visual clues. So for example, um, there might be some grammatical or spelling errors, but it's pretty limited. Um, and the graphics are usually pretty good. Uh, not fuzzy, not skewed. Um, there, a work context does exist, so it's related um, to them and uh, it's quite valid in terms of if they were to receive this. Uh, there's specific and appropriate recipients, so it's uh, maybe addressed to them. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, there's uh, links and graphics uh, which appear correct and um, uh, without have them having to go in and verify that they're correct. And then hard is it's, it's an almost perfect email. There's literally zero to one um, clues that this could be a phishing email. So it's perfect in terms of um, it's, a, it's appropriate. Uh, the context is there. Uh, you've obfuscated the links so they can't really click on them. So without a bit of technical knowledge, they couldn't, you know, go expand those links or understand where they go to. Um, there's a strong emotional response uh, that, uh, will sort of hinder them detecting that this there's a pretense behind this, a, a malicious pretense. Um, and uh, two that fit into this category are double barrel and business, business email compromise uh, emails or phishing, simula phishing simulations. So double barrel is one where they receive an initial email 
uh, and it doesn't have any attachments um, but it provides them a bit of context and says, hey, um, here's the document that I would meant to, uh, that I promised to send to you. Um, you know, take a look and let me know what you think. But there's nothing attached. And then there's a follow-up email, you know, a few minutes uh, later or, you know, however the period, along the period is that you specify that says, oh, sorry, I forgot to attach that document. So it sounds all very conversational and friendly and, you know, here's the invoice and um, sorry, I forgot to attach it on the previous one. So it doesn't sound like something that's been constructed. It sounds like, uh, you know, something that uh, you could easily receive um, or misreceive and then go, oh, what's in that attachment? It wasn't meant for me, but I'll have a look anyway. Um, so that's sort of how I've classified uh, our emails. So then uh, your next step is creating the educational content. So with your educational content, keep it really, really, really super simple, uh, like simple, single messages, uh, if possible. You uh, preferably would update the educational content with each campaign. So for example, you put in context about uh, this was the email that you received and this is how you could have detected that this email, um, that it was a phishing, phishing one and or some common factors. But again, keep it visual, simple, easy to read, like literally takes no more than, you know, four to 10 seconds for the, to, them to consume on the screen. Um, so there's not too many words or anything like that. Uh, keep the education con uh, content relevant to the theme. So for example, if you're talking, if you've sent a link based um, uh, phishing simulation, you'd have a link based education page telling them about links and how to hover over links and things like that. Uh, if you can make it interactive, so polls, quizzes, games, videos, reveals, things like that, there are some of the tools that will actually let you do that by default, which is great. Other things like free tools, you actually have to build that yourself. So it makes it a little bit harder. And then always be thinking about the end goal and be reinforcing that when people hit that education page. What you want employees to do is recognize and report, recognize and report, recognize and report. So if you've got a button there uh, in their email and uh, you know, you got a little, for example, um, ours has a little fish, um, you put that fish on the education page and say, report phishing this way um, so that they go back and do that once they've actually seen the education page or they know to do that in, in the future. Okay, so we mentioned before, if you're in a larger organization, you might have to whitelist links and domains. Uh, so it depends on your infrastructure. Uh, it might have to be done at your email provider or anti-spam uh, service provider. Um, and that will make sure that your phishing simulations don't get blocked uh, before they even make it to your employees. Um, so don't, if you're in a large organization, don't underestimate how long this can potentially take. For example, if you've outsourced that to a vendor, you might have to pre-plan that, um, give them, you know, all your phishing simulations and sort of give it to them um, every month with sort of, you know, three weeks notice, for example. Uh, it's even better if you can actually pre-plan your simulations for three to six months in advance and get them whitelisted, you know, it's on a set date and then delist them um, after that date. Don't forget to delist if you've whitelisted white something. And then you test your scenarios. So you'd send it to yourself and others that you trust um, to get their feedback. You do a spelling and grammar check. So not your typical spelling and grammar check where you go and make sure potentially that all the spelling and grammar is fixed up, but does it make sense for the level that you're sending out? Um, education design, does it meet your internal communication standards? So for example, internal comms might say we'd like it branded with our colors and our logo and things like that. And that's actually a really good idea just from the perspective of when people start receiving phishing simulation emails, they want to know, for example, that this was just a simulation and you've got your logo in the top and it says, don't worry, you know, this was just a simulation, but here's how to recognize it next time. And it's with your colors and things like that. So they understand this was an internal communication. It's not, they haven't been phished for real because um, people can get a little bit confused about that sort of stuff. So just make sure that the email formatting, for example, if you're sending an email uh, phishing simulation, is renders okay on different devices that you have on your desktop build supported phones. Uh, that when you go, you know, you do a go test to make sure all the links that you've got in that email go to the right um, page, i.e. the education page. So again, the big red flag about copyright infringement, so no logos or images of real companies or people. Um, I'm not sure if I put it in the resources, but I'll find it and post it up there uh, in the discussion forum and also on fishingcountermeasures.com this week. There's actually a website where um, you can go find, uh, get photos of real people and they've allowed you to use it for um, commercial purposes so you can use them in your fishing simulations. 
Um, so that's a really good idea. There's lots of free, if you go search for free images uh, and just make sure that you've got the, um, the rights to use them in the context, then go, go use those. Uh, that's a really good idea for getting uh, free imagery that you can use in your emails and on your pages, on your education pages. And then obviously get management approval to send and let all the people that should know, know about it. Uh, so this is the, st then you send your stakeholder notifications, as I said, uh, and schedule your scenario. So people that you might want to let know are your um, CISOs, your chief information security officer, your security manager, whoever that might be in your organization, your CIO, uh, depends who your, what your structure is. Your internal communications manager, if you have one of those, because they're going to get um, contacted about uh, messages that have gone out. Uh, saying, have you seen this message that went out? Um, then your legal representatives, you might want them to have a bit of a, they might want to be in the loop of these as well, just to make sure that we are covering off all those little, um, you know, ticks and checks around a copyright infringement. And your friendly cybersecurity threat management team. So for example, if you're not in the threat management team, you'd want to send it to them to make sure that when they start get, getting uh, phishing reports, that um, they know that this one was a simulation. So a good idea to provide them with a copy of the email, a copy of the education page, um, you know, and the, the metadata. So the from, the email address, uh, what the subject line was, dates that this is being sent to and from, and guidance on how they should respond to people who ask if it's a phishing email, because you will get that response back to, from people. They'll go, oh, internal comms, I've got this email. Is it a phishing email? And the response there is, click on the report phishing button. <laughs> and then you'll see, <laughs> it'll pop up a message and say it was or it wasn't. Um, to always keep that really consistent. Now you never tell them that it is a phishing simulation. You just tell them um, if possible, if you've got that button there, just to click the button and the button will tell you straight away. Uh, and then give them an appropriate notice period. So send, send them this notification sort of, you know, uh, 24 to 48 hours out before you actually schedule it, then you schedule it. Then you've got your analysis and results. So after the scenario finishes, you want to analyze the data to identify key metrics. So these are some of the key things. So uh, from you've sort of got red to green down here with our little traffic light system uh, in terms of green is the, um, you know, the, this is the optimal scenario. The more people you have in the green bit, the better it is. Um, the less people you have in the red bit, the better it is. So uh, up in, you want to have the metric of number of employees that were susceptible. So if people are clicking links, uh, entering their personal details, opening attachments and did not report it, they're the people you need to work on. So you analyze that in, in the data that you collect. Number of employees who were susceptible and did report, it's awesome that they reported, but they were still susceptible. So there's a little bit of work to do with them as well. Number of employees that did not open and did not report the email. It's great that they didn't open it, but they also didn't report it. Um, so you still want people to reporting, be reporting emails because that goes into your intelligence gathering around phishing when it becomes to a real phishing um, uh, communication that goes out. And then your ideal uh, employees who get all the gold stars are your employee, number of employees who are not susceptible and did report. Um, so you kind of want to uh, classify and group people like that and analyze uh, who those people are. So some examples of some phishing simulation tools. There's quite a number out there and I've come up with a list of them on phishingcountermeasures.com. If you go to the tools section in the menu, there's a list of uh, phishing simulation tools that I've found so far. Some are more for pen testing purposes. So they're very techy. Um, you know, they require you to have Ruby on Rails and all sorts of prerequisites around it. And you need to do, you know, coding or, um, you know, a command line uh, uh, sort of configuration of it. Uh, obviously recommend those for, you know, your people with more technical knowledge, but there's ones with, uh, you know, nice interfaces and pretty GUIs uh, that work for people who don't have that technical background as well. So uh, one that I really like is, uh, it's called CoFence FishMe. It used to be called uh, FishMe Simulator. They've recently changed their name. And uh, they provide you with a free version of their commercial product. So with the free version, you can do 12 scenarios a year. Um, and so that's really useful um, and that's the recommended number of simulations that you should do at a minimum is 12 scenarios. So one a month to all your employees is sort of the best um, or good practice. Uh, then they've got a small vision, uh, business version, which is 500 employees or below, and then an enterprise version, which has a few more features for uh, 500 employees or above. Uh, it's web hosted, so you don't have to set up your own infrastructure or anything like that. You literally sign up, for example, if you go for the free version, sign up on their website and they'll provision it for you. Um, it's 
it's pretty comprehensive. You can do the click, the attachment, the double entry, and the, uh, the data entry and the double barrel examples that I mentioned before. They've got free pre-built education content. And they've got the bits like quizzes and um, you know uh, interactive uh, bits. They've got infographics, um, text-based, so all different types of education content that they've pre-built. And I believe in the free version that you still get access to all that free content that they've developed. It's just that you're limited by the number of scenarios. Then they've got, for anybody, um, you can go to their website. You don't even have to use their product, but they've got free computer-based training modules that you can upload to your LMS system. So if you go to their website and have a look around under their free tools, they've got CBT modules. You just have to provide your details. Um, so your name, email address, I think company, something like that. And um, they will... Uh, provide you with, I think there's about at least 12 different um, computer-based training modules around phishing and malware, uh, spear phishing, and a few different things like that. So that's great even if you don't use the, the tool. They also provide a free report phishing Outlook add-in uh, as part of the suite. So for Outlook on Windows and Mac, um, Outlook Web Access, and um, Outlook on mobile as well. So that's one area to consider as well, is that if you kind of want the advanced features of being employees being able to report on mobile, then you're probably going, I haven't come across any uh, products that have, uh, you know, sort of like a report phishing add-in for mobile. Um, so you're probably going to have to go with something um, that's paid, although you might check that the, the free version actually provides you with the, the add-in as well uh, for mobile. Um, so there's another one called Geo Insight. It's really simple. Um, it might be good for some uh, basic tests. So uh, you must own the domain. So you've actually got to validate that uh, that you send from. So you've actually got to, with that one, there's a, a cost involved in the purchase of the domains. It's web hosted, which is a bonus because then you don't have to set up your own infrastructure, obviously. It's got fairly basic features. So it allows minor customizations to things like the sender name, um, but you've got uh, limited sender email address option. So like I said, you've got to own the domains that it comes from. There's no education customization. So that's not really great from a, um, you know, reinforcing things and having an ongoing campaign that really works. But it might be good for sort of a one-off to test, see how it goes in your organization or with a pilot group. Um, you can, can create a custom um, email. So the content, actual email content itself, um, or chose, you can choose from a few uh, pre-designed emails. So they've got like a web-based access one, a Dropbox similar one, or a OneDrive similar one as well. And then if they provide you simple stats that you can then export to CSV or JSON um, to, you know, um, mash up yourself. So this is uh, a bit of a screenshot of what they provide. Um, they also detect things like uh, the uh, plugins that people had when they visited the browser. So that, say it was a link-based attachment, uh, link-based uh, phishing simulation. They actually uh, go and detect um, if they've got uh, out-of-date plugins as well. And then it gives you a bit of an um, overview here. So it was a phishing drill. This was a summary. Uh, they give you a little bit of um, timing details uh, and what the activity is if you go and click on these things. Then there's another one. This is the one that we're using in this week's lab. It's called GoFish. It's free and it's open source. Uh, you install it on your own machine. So you, uh, obviously you'd have your own uh, infrastructure for this one. You go set up a server, for example, uh, and provision it with uh, an operating system. So there's a cost involved there to you. Uh, it works on Windows, Mac, and Linux, of course, unless you go for a free Linux um, operating system. Uh, then it's got some pretty good features. It, it's sort of in between, it sort of sits in between the, the commercial one that we said at the start, the CoFence Fish Me, and the one that I just showed you, the Geo Insight one, because you can customize a lot more and you've got more control over uh, the content as well. So you can customize and manage groups, email templates, uh, landing pages that people go to, so the education pages. Uh, you can import from an existing uh, email as, to use as a template. Uh, you can add files to the phishing simulation as well, so you can embed a education in an attachment. Uh, but there's no, you kind of starting from scratch, so there's no sort of standard email templates that you start off with immediately. So you kind of have to create your own uh, right from the get-go. But I'd say that's a pretty um, low barrier to entry in terms of it's free. Um, you can get it up and running pretty quickly. Now, if you're looking, if you do go for something that's free and you're looking for a report phishing add-in, there's a 
company called Know Before, and they have uh, a number of free tools, actually some really cool tools there that you can use for education awareness. Uh, but from a phishing perspective, they've got the um, Outlook add-in. So it works on Windows Outlook, Exchange, so OWA, and as a Chrome extension. So that's, for example, if you use Gmail um, in the browser. Uh, so people can report phishing from uh, those machines. It's free to use. So you literally go there. Again, you have to plug in your details. Um, and they can also do things like a free phishing simulation test and um, luckily they've got a ransomware simulator and so on and so forth. So you can go check those out as well. Um, so as I mentioned, I popped up on the phishingcountermeasures.com site, a list of all the ones that I know about. Uh, but if you hear of other ones or you use other ones as well, please feel free to go suggest those in the forum. I'm sure everybody really interested to find out what um, works for you. And we're up to readings and homework. Um, so uh, before we take questions, I'll just quickly touch on this we've got um, you can I mentioned the fishing dark waters uh, web uh, book earlier in this session and uh, you can actually go read some of those chapters for free so if you don't want to uh, or can't afford to buy the book you can go read some of the chapters and chapter two in particular walks through the the psychology um, and an overview side of things which is quite interesting and the book takes a fairly conversational tone so it's quite easy to read um, that link there, when you go to it in your, um, I promise you it's not a phishing link. <laughs> uh, uh, when you go to it in um, your readings and homework uh, sheet, uh, you can click on it and it'll take you off to the, the free version in Google Books. So as I mentioned in the lab this week, we're designing a phishing simulation end to end. So I want to see some awesome versions of, you know, the best you can do in terms of designing a phishing email and then uh, the education page. So that's the main things. Um, so go through the lab, it's fairly detailed. You've been provided with a pre-configured virtual machine with GoFish installed and MailHog as well. So the purpose of GoFish obviously is to design and send the phishing simulation. Uh, the purpose of MailHog, which is the other tool installed on the Ubuntu uh, virtual machine, is to capture that email and show it to you in a browser. So you're never actually sending the phishing simulation out to real people. It'll capture it before it ever hits the real world. Um, so it appears sort of like just as a, um, uh, an email uh, program in the browser, which is uh, fairly uh, handy. And it's usually used for um, email testing purposes. So we're using it for phishing simulations, uh, which should work really well. Uh, so we might head over to questions. I think we're a bit over. I apologize for that. But um, if anyone would like to stay on for questions, by all means, hit me with them. Guy? All righty. Uh, let's start with Harry, who asked uh, whether, uh, sorry, some staff ask how they can check a suspected phishing link without having to contact IT. I suppose these are the, the educated staff. Uh, from an IT support perspective, is it a good idea to empower users by setting up a sandbox location? Um, it's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you could, um, and obviously if they're tax savvy, then maybe you would have less qualms about doing that. Uh, and if it's truly sandboxed, then it wouldn't probably wouldn't be, uh, so much of a problem. And you can obviously point them towards, you know, in the sandbox, you can actually point them towards those tools that we used, uh, that we ran through, um, in week two. So last week, uh, that would help them identify that. But obviously, um, your average uh, employee probably isn't capable of, you know, using um, sandboxes and detecting phishing and things like that. And that's, I see that as one of the sort of big gaps in, um, you know, phishing is that there's no sort of real way to sort of visually present to people uh, an easy way to identify if something is a phishing email. And there's so many different, um, the reason is there's so many different technical challenges around uh, having a tool like that to start with. Um, so it's, it's definitely possible. Um, I'd caution it with uh, make sure the people that are using it actually really are tech savvy, uh, but it's probably not appropriate for your um, gen general population um, in your, in your environment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of quick questions about the labs. Is it, Oh, from YM, is it okay to run the exercises on a Linux machine rebuilt every week? Uh, yes, sure. Beauty. No uh, and Omar asks, do I have to own a domain to do the lab? 
No. Uh, the good thing about the GoFish is that you can literally make up any email address and any domain you like, and MailHog's going to capture it anyway before it ever hits the real world. So um, you can make up anything you like and use that. You don't have to buy anything for the lab. Uh, there's, there's nothing that you need to purchase. Uh, it's all free and the tools are free. Okay, and I hope that answers your question as well, Mitesh. Let me know if it doesn't. Uh, is it better to educate the majority of staff or handpick the staff for education, as often is the case where if a single member of the team is educated, the knowledge transferred is not effective? I think we were touching on that earlier on. Uh, is, there a, is there a best or is it just a maybe? Depends. Um, I guess in terms of... Of the, um, the reason that you're doing the fishing simulations to start with is because generally uh, good practice is to do it right across your employee population uh, rather than pick uh, particular uh, teams or people. Um, however, in saying that, I would actually, uh, depending on the risk that you identify for a particular, particular team, you might identify, for example, like we mentioned in the previous uh, uh, Example, we, we mentioned the finance department, for example, they're at high risk uh, of receiving uh, fake invoices. So for them, you might actually decide that you're going to run special phishing simulations in addition to the general population simulations. Um, but I just de de generally recommend that when you implement them, you, rec uh, you implement across your, your employee population. Um, and then use your the metrics and the data that you actually gather to identify if there's teams that need specific, you know, a little bit more hand-holding, a little bit more um, training, one-to-one -one or group training or whatever it might be. Uh, we've actually had, since we've implemented this, um, we've actually had teams come to us and say, can you come and um, give our team a special session because we'd love to learn more about it, which is just fabulous. We've gone from, the, you know, to go from the point of, you know, no one knowing about it to the point of people actually asking us to come and um, deliver customized training to their team um, is, is a really good um, point of progress. Jillian's chimed in on the chat with cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility to which everyone seems to. Uh, it is <laughs> in the positive. <laughs> and that you'll find that that's the biggest in edu any education, cybersecurity education program. It doesn't have to even have to be cybersecurity, it can be physical security as well. But in any sort of um, security education program, you will find um, that that's your biggest challenge to overcome is that um, people don't think it's their responsibility. So often, um, the just as a general tip for education, the way that um, you might want to approach it is to not talk about security and risk and you know all those other words that people probably don't care too much about uh, but to, more to talk about their safety and relate it back to how for example you can protect your kids at home um, or um, you know how they can protect their parents from being scammed or you know bring it back to a personal situation a situation that, where they ask what's in it for me you know what's the why would I actually want to know about this stuff um, and you kind of then have to sit down and, and start thinking about okay so why would our employees be interested in this sort of thing um, and it, it often comes back to okay they've got kids to protect they've got you know elderly parents that uh, just started using the internet for example they want to protect them from scams or they get phone they might not even be using the internet there might be phone scams for example um, so yeah always be thinking about the, the what's in it for me and, and bringing it back to to that when you educate people okay Ray Ray has asked uh, what is a good way to talk to senior management uh, I think it's uh, who have been scammed and show them data I've been he's been doing this for a couple of years now but as many times as he runs this campaign more or less the same people click on the emails uh, he's worried now that because they know more about this now they do not care as much right yeah it's, well with any uh, I guess with any security education program you do run the risk of um, you know, uh, I guess people just get used to things, which is why, uh, you know, keeping your content fresh, keeping the types of uh, simulations that you run fresh. Um, also, uh, I'll talk about next week, uh, you know, running things like having a leaderboard and running competitions internally to get people engaged and keep them engaged and motivated to keep doing this. Um, so I guess it, coming back to the original question though, what's a good way to talk to senior management about um, how employees have been scammed and show them the data? Um, it's a really good idea with any education program to get support from right at the top of your organization. 
and um, have those people on board in terms of supporting this so that whenever they're talking about this to their direct reports, who are the executives or, um, you know, the, the senior managers in the organization, they're saying that this is something that's really important to us, um, you know, bringing in statistics around potentially your actual live phishing uh, uh, scam. So for example, if your organization has been scammed out of paying invoices or things like that, you get, and then you can start correlating it to the, the data around how long it took to recover, how much it cost the organization, you know, um, uh, you know, what sort of people were involved in that. Um, so presenting uh, some of the data back to people around, uh, you know, this is the reason we do it is because this is, these are the incidents that have actually happened. Um, or if you don't have those incidents, you know, taking some of the case studies, for example, that everybody has been fabulous in posting from week one up on the forums uh, and using that as a bit of ammo for, um, for, for these stats uh, but definitely having executive support and then you essentially have the executive support from the top and make sure that you're you know whoever you report to if it's the CISO or the CIO or whoever it is is always talking about this program and reinforcing how important it is um, and then you bring it up from the bottom as well in terms of pushing it out to employees uh, through the simulations so it's a multi-pronged attack and you need support from all different levels of the organization to be able to achieve your message you're just not going to be able to do it by yourself if it's just you pushing um or maybe you can amazing if you can but usually you have to have support from you know multiple different um, places in the organization to make it work all right uh lens asked in addition to a point in time phishing campaign are you aware of any anti-phishing products or services that are designed to remain on indefinitely and react with real phishing emails uh, he gives an example of uh, uh let's say a phishing example is a phishing email is received and detected and the malicious URL is removed or replaced with an internal safe URL before being delivered to the recipient. And then you can gather information and with, with the clicks that are forwarded to the internal safe education site. Um, I know that there is a vendor potentially working on this area at the moment. Um, Ooh, hush, they... hush. <laughs> I can't say who, um, but potentially working on improving that whole process from we received a real phishing campaign in our organization and now let's convert that into, um, you know, a phishing simulation. Um, but as of this point in time, I can't say that I know of anyone for sure doing, uh, doing that. Although I have to say, like, let me just say that I have not assessed all the different tools um, in, you know, 100% fine grained um, detail either. So there may be people out there, but I haven't seen it to date personally. Okay. I guess you'll all just have to pay attention to the Fishing Countermeasures Measures website, which I'm sure will be updated with uh, relevant information once it comes to hand and Bianca can spill <laughs> beans. Uh, Brett McClintock is asking about Duo Insight, um, one of the Examples of oh, the, yes. the yep. tools we could use. Uh, you, it's, uh, the slide says you must own the domain you are sending to. So can you can you make up a domain name in this tool as the sender? No, you can't. Sorry. Um, so you literally, I think there's a validation that you have to do. So I think you have to, from memory, um, uh, either put something in inside the website itself and it goes through and does a check to make sure that you uh, own it sort of like when you own a website and you want to set up google analytics for it you actually need to go in and add a file to the website it goes and checks that it's actually there and that validates that you own the website i think it does something similar um uh, so you would would need to definitely own the domains to be able to run run that one okay uh that's all the questions we have which is uh, which is nice, I guess, for once. Um, <laughs> thanks very much, Bianca, of, of course, for uh, um, another lovely presentation, and Diane as well for moderating chat. And thank all of you. Thanks all of you. You're, you're all superstars in the chat and questions and participation, and the forums looking great. So I hope you're all having a blast and getting something out of it. What's next week again? Okay, so next week we're going to go through a bit more detail around um, the. Um, setting up a phishing strategy. So if you actually wanted to sit down and do phishing simulations internally, um, essentially I want to give you the detail around uh, like writing up a strategy document so that you can take it to management and say, this is what we're proposing to do. This is how we're going to run it. Um, and here's all the details. So essentially you could plan out uh, your phishing simulations. We've also, I've also left 
a fair um, chunk of time in case people want to ask questions about the exam. So obviously I can't tell you what the questions are in the exam, but I'm happy to answer questions that you might have around the content or get clarifications. Um, yeah, and then I'll re-show those awesome t-shirts that we've got uh, for the top 10 exam point scorers as well. Tough competition. Tough competition. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Thanks very much, Bianca. Have a good week. No worries. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>